let's look again at the clinical presentation of a radial nerve injury to discern what we as therapists can do to best intervene. We discussed the classic presentation of the wrist drop. When the patient is unable to actively extend the wrist and or fingers and thumb, all of these extensor muscles remain in a stretched position for prolonged periods of time. Therefore, one of the hallmarks of care for the patient with a radial nerve injury is to provide some sort of wrist extension to take all these muscle tendon units off of their maximum stretch. Ideally, we would like that wrist support to be constructed in such a way as to create greater function and not simply to support the wrist. When the radial nerve is injured, all of the flexors to the, all of the fingers as well as the wrist remain intact. All of the intrinsic muscles to the fingers and the thumb are intact and all of the sensibility of the palm is intact. In other words, the hand in terms of its flexion ability and its ability to maneuver the fingers is intact. But what is absent is all of the extrinsic wrist and finger extensors and there's no ability to support the wrist while the hand then is moving an object or exerting any power. It is the inability to stabilize the wrist and to fully open the fingers that creates the disability from the radial nerve injury. If we could stabilize the wrist and assist the fingers in opening, then there's relatively normal functional use of the hand that is available. The inability to stabilize the wrist means that full finger flexion is not easy to accomplish because the wrist when it is maximally flexed creates tension on the extensor system providing resistance to full finger flexion. Finger extension in the interphalangeal joints is possible because all of the interosseous and lumbrical muscles are active and they are able to extend the fingers at the interphalangeal joints. The only metacarpal phalangeal joint extensor power is from the extrinsic extensors, the extensor digitorum communis. Therefore, if you ask the patient to extend, they will only be able to extend the interphalangeal joints. Here, the patient is supporting her own wrist, but even with the wrist support, this is still the maximum finger extension. What would be ideal, in my opinion, in the hand with radial palsy would be to convert the radial palsy hand where only really interphalangeal joint extension and flexion is relatively normal and somehow recreate the normal tenodesis pattern of the hand. In other words, to recreate for the patient the ability to fully flex the fingers and simultaneously there is reciprocal extension of the wrist. The converse is then true. We would like to see that as the fingers extend, the wrist comes into some flexion, never below neutral, but it comes toward the neutral posture, which is the normal balance between the extrinsic flexors and extensors of the hand. So my question is, how are we able to recreate this for a patient with radial palsy? We will look specifically at orthotic intervention with a view toward recreating this. But first, let's discuss a bit what is involved in rehabilitation. Of the three peripheral nerves, because small muscles are not involved, nor is functional sensibility involved, the rehabilitation of a radial nerve injury is relatively easy. We need to be able to answer the question accurately. 
how can we assist the patient with making the hand the most functional it can be as the nerve is returning? And as the nerve is returning, we want to be able to strengthen the returning muscles without overloading them. It would be ideal if we could do both of these things simultaneously. Because of the wrist drop deformity and the constant elongation of the extensor muscle tendon units, a few times during the day the patient should manually elongate the flexor tendon units by doing a passive wrist and finger extension stretch. Whether it's in the prayer position with the palms together or whether one hand is stretching the other hand. But sometime during the day, each day, preferably more than once, there should be full elongation of the extrinsic flexor units. Now the radial nerve, if injured mid-shaft, which is the most common, presents the classic wrist drop pattern. So we will discuss orthotic intervention for this level of injury primarily. Keep in mind that an injury to the radial nerve at this level has a long way to go to fully re -innervate. and therefore it may be months or a year or more before the radial nerve re occurs. This is a long period of time for which a patient needs an orthotic intervention to recreate function. Mm -hmm.